All right. Welcome to part two of my interview with Sperry Andrews. Sperry's in Honolulu right now where it's beautiful, warm, and daytime. And I'm in the cold, rainy, wet UK in the middle of winter. <laughs> so greetings, everybody. Welcome back. Sperry, we wanted to take this conversation into interpersonal relationships a little bit more. And I love your work, especially because you are an advocate for vulnerable sharing in order to emotionally heal. And obviously, one of the main points of Deconstructing Sentience, the documentary I made, was feeling is healing and how connection is key. And never before has our connection been more challenged than it is right now, right? Our ability to connect because of distancing and regulations and restrictions. And we talked about masks a bit. It's, it's really being jeopardized. And, you know, I always say immunity is community. I am unity is immunity. So I wanted to bring our attention maybe there as we get real and get a little bit more vulnerable about what's going on in our interpersonal relationships and how to navigate end times madness, how to navigate this tectonic shift in consciousness that we're all experiencing, however aware of it we might be, and however that might be manifesting in our own individual reality bubbles. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's look into, you know, how we share, uh, this single consciousness that we're all expressions of, uh, life created us. Uh, we're, we're an expression of this earth and this cosmos, uh, uh, and we're grappling in, you know, a scientific, military, industrial, political, medical, religious establishments. Uh, and we have, we're taking our power back from these establishments and owning the fact that we need to establish what it is that we really feel is true uh, and be able to share that sensitively, uh, ever more sensitively, uh, evolve in an ever more sensitive way, uh, individually and indivisibly together. So I personally feel very challenged throughout my life by, you know, how do I relate to other people who have some idea of who they think they are, what they think they're doing, uh, that is often divorced from what they really might truly feel and sense if they were more awake, uh, for example. <laughs> and knowing from my own life experience, from my near-death experience at the age of four, that I, uh, where I existed without a body, heart, or mind, uh, where there was no me, there was just this awareness which had nothing to be aware of other than itself. Uh, and so it was like water being poured into water. So it was very like being a drop in the ocean and yet being uh, just you know, the ocean itself as, 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 as pure water, uh, as a, this objectless, imageless, uh, indivisible, timeless, ever-present awakeness that uh, is choiceless, uh, in a sense, like the mirror in the bathroom we've spoke about that uh, just receives and reflects. So in training... Uh, through perceptual recognition, through sensing and feeling and contemplation of this mirror-like quality of my uh, my eternal nature, my deathless nature, uh, and looking for people, many, much of the time desperately, you know, begging people to exploring whether they might possibly be able to share this. Uh, uh, this quality of consciousness that I find so um, inescapable, let's say, uh, as, a, as fundamental or f foundational to, to who and what I truly am. Um, and knowing it to be a safe haven, a, a place where uh, I can be uh, like the mirror, 
that do, that receives and reflects flawlessly and faithfully, but it doesn't react. It doesn't disown or judge or condemn. It, it just sees things as, as they are. Uh, I'm able to appreciate what is for what it is uh, without mm, you know, categorizing it uh, unnecessarily, except to um, you know, help this consciousness that that pre-exists me uh, as a as an individual, unique human being that is primordial, that existed before time and space, uh, before energy and matter, minds and bodies, uh, that is truly um, uh, that which unites all that is as an indivisible whole and uh, and unites me as an individual so in this exploration of attempting to find others that i can sh share this quality of consciousness with consciously uh it's been a very painful very sh you know shaming and be you know kind of experience where people disown me they find me frightening or weird or crazy or they don't know how to relate to me uh, and i didn't growing up i didn't know how or why they would be doing that it didn't make any sense to me because i seem to be totally open to being one with them and uh you know my own mother and father uh were afraid of really sharing their authentic selves. They didn't seem to know how to be truly in touch with what, uh, with who and what they truly are that I am with them. And it was very, very confusing and, uh, and, and terrifying and traumatizing. I mean, uh, I had experiences going to school on the school bus when I was a little boy feeling like maybe everybody is like, actors in some kind of weird science fiction drama that are here to to play a, a trick on me to try to mind mesmerize me into believing that i'm a separate individual when i'm actually who i know myself to be and it was you know very fear-based and i that day that i had that experience in the school bus i had found something that looked like a um uh, like a dark uh, kidney bean in my oatmeal. And I thought, what is that? That's not oatmeal. Maybe my mother is trying to drug me into believing that she's my mother. And <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to think. Uh, so the evolution of my thinking mind, my emotional body, my, you know, my reptilian sensory motor embodiment uh, as a human being, has been quite a um, quite a phantasmagoria, uh, and most people they never experienced what I've just been talking about. It would seem completely weird, and uh, just the fact that I would talk about things that sound completely crazy, and that they can't relate to, that they don't feel and they don't sense and they don't think about, uh, marginalize me and puts me in a you know, in a proverbial uh, no-go zone. Have you experienced anything like that? Totally. Uh, <laughs> you are speaking my language, and I love phantasmagoria. That's my new favorite word. <laughs> I'm going to write it down and use it. Um, but no, you're sharing so vulnerably, and that's really inspiring me to also share aspects of my truth and, and difficulties in my life, especially my childhood, it made me feel like an outcast. It made me feel like the misfit. I always felt like the black sheep of the family. And I've had experiences played out throughout my life that have reinforced that feeling of being misunderstood, misrepresented. And uh, really, I've, I've felt a reject a lot. And I still can manifest that pattern into physical reality sometimes. I remember as a child feeling terrified to look in the mirror because every time I looked directly at myself as I'm doing now in the lens to inspire shared awareness it's 
it was as if I didn't recognize my face. I knew that I was something greater than the physical vehicle, the vessel, the body. And it would scare me because I had no construct to understand what it is I was experiencing in that moment. So I would avoid looking at myself at all for years. I did because I would fall into this sense of not knowing who I was at all. And, and that was incredibly frightening. Um, but hearing you have had those experiences sort of makes the unbearable bearable, if you will, because it makes me realize, oh, I'm not alone. I remember, oh, we're connected. And those of us who form this light grid that I was talking about in the first episode, episode, we are spatially distanced for a very important reason at the moment. So a lot of us are experiencing still that lack of connection that has caused so much suffering throughout life. And, you know, to make our own communities, I think, is probably the next step. That's where I have intuitive insight, if you will, from my guides in the Pleiades as to how this is going to play out is we will find each other and start manifesting more awake and aware communities in the physical and I'm really looking forward to that. And I want to put some action steps to make that happen in my own holographic reality bubble, the projection of my own consciousness that I experience, because I need that connection and I'm realizing it. And I get it from you, you know, when we converse and connect, uh, you know, virtually. But it helps me because it helps me make sense of all of those experiences that I had. I also remember watching Back to the Future when I was quite young. I can't remember when it came out. I don't know, 10 or something. I was petrified for years after that because I knew that it was full of inversions and distortions and horrific prophecies. I could sense it on some level that something was really not right. But again, I had no paradigm or structure to even begin to understand why I felt that way. And I believe that We've both had that experience and anyone who considers themselves to be a starseed, a way shower, a light worker, or a truther, most of our lives probably have included uh, that feeling of disconnection of being the outcast or the misfit or the black sheep. And maybe that's the training we needed to stand up and speak out in this now moment and to finally own our own sovereignty and step up in our own self-empowerment resonating from the throat chakra, creating from our the pure essence of our sentient expression, those co-creational powers that are unique to us. Each one of us has been gifted with an, a, 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 a very unique set of skills that we're meant to, to bestow upon the earth plane, this planet, humanity's awakening right now. And my heart aches for those who aren't able to express in that way because Maybe they've, they've not been understood by their peer groups or their teachers or their nuclear families or, you know, in the workplace, we could go on and on and on. Even our spiritual communities are so full of infighting sometimes. Um, you know, we hear the words disinfo agent, shields, it's chucked about all the time and, and it can be incredibly damaging. And I think when, when we aren't able as starseeds to make our way to uh, fulfilling our dharma if we get stuck in the cycles of karma which is accelerated right now in 4d we can fall prey to the lower vibrational aspects of like helplessness like that's kind of the lowest ebb on the vibrational ladder that's when you get the suicidal thoughts coming in that's when you can get really stuck in addiction i almost killed myself it was passive suicide drinking myself to death in 2012 so I know, and that led to my near-death experience, which was my greatest teacher. However, there can be casualties along the way between breakdowns and breakthroughs. So how do we make sure that we minimize those and come together? You and I are now sharing vulnerably in attempt to do that. So whoever feels like we have a lot of our lives uh, can maybe relate and resonate with that and know that perhaps that was the training you needed in this now moment to start to own and live your purpose, your, your, your mission, your life work, your soul intent, the reason you incarnated here at this time, which is so exciting, but it can be really, really painful. 
And I want to turn pain into purpose, you know, and be an agent for that change. Does that resonate with you, Spez? Yes, darling. Thank you. Uh, you're so wonderful. I mean, thank you, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Christmas. Uh, I came to a point where I was, of course, quite curious as to why was I going through hell and high waters uh, in no uncertain terms, you know, hour after hour, day after day, you know, month after month, year after year. Uh, and, you know, finally, I was just, you know, asking in all humility and total surrender, uh, completely powerless uh, to, to change it. And uh, in honestly and sincerely asking, you know, why, why is this happening to me? Poor me, you know, I, I went through many years of self-pity, like, this is horrific. Why, why is this poor little person who's so, such a sweetie pie, you know, why is he being like absolutely smushed and smeared and tormented and vivisected, uh, you know, second by second, like feeling like I'm being torn apart by a tornado or something. I mean, it was that intense at times. And what came to me, and what ultimately, of course, had to come to me, is that uh, the purpose of going through all that was to help me understand what other people uh, are going through, so that I could be empathetic and compassionate and, uh, and commune with them without fear, without avoidance of their pain and suffering and torment. Uh, and share this indivisible in unity that is at the very, uh, you know, core of, of all that we are that does not suffer and does not react to these life lessons at the relative, you know, sentient human level, uh, and, uh, and be strong for them and say, look, uh, we, we can share this and uh and by sharing it the magnitude of our combined attentiveness sharing undivided attention which if you held a child and your beloved to your heart uh you know the, your greatest friend you can sense how sharing undivided attention in a fully embodied way is indistinguishable from sharing unconditional love this communion of being one and all uh, and no one really that which has no mo has no identity except that of love and of consciousness itself so it's not that we need to avoid or uh, as, you know my advocacy is that we don't need to it's not that we need to avoid or escape suffering it's rather that we need to learn from suffering uh, how to understand what others are going through, how the how what it is to be a human being, because so many are suffering on this planet. Uh, those who have billions of dollars, who you know, who want to avoid suffering, who uh, perpetrate suffering and horrors on others. And those who are by the by the hundreds of millions, if not billions, you know, living in abject poverty and and they don't know where they you know, where their next meal is coming from, and uh, they don't have clean drinking water, and uh, and they're probably uh, what did they say? The figures are that about twenty thousand children, which is equivalent of something like a hundred and twenty jumbo jets filled with children are crashing and burning and dying of starvation something like every every hour or or every day i mean it's getting worse so if we don't if we're not a, a bill, have the ability to care about what each other feels and senses not only our our friends and family that that tribe that we in the same way we we identify with 
who we think we are and what we think we're doing as a as a unique individual that is you know fresh and new every moment and surprising and delightful <laughs> hopefully um and our friends and and family who we adore and we cling to for our security and uh so that we have others who feel with us and that love us that and allow us to to feel this communion of love with them uh we need uh, as einstein said to, we need to go beyond that uh you know that prison uh of separative consciousness to uh to include all life and nature um he said it so beautiful beautifully in that quote that probably many of you have have read maybe we can post it in the uh in the um you know underneath the video for you to explore and, and his beautiful letter to his daughter uh which is so gorgeous uh, einstein as a scientist uh, talking about love as being the real discovery uh greater than anything else that he discovered in all of his science so you know even you know the greatest of us uh, within each of us knows that that love is the answer uh the first summer cast on the planet earth was the beatles singing all there is is love all we need is love you know so you know love seems like it's something which is you know it could be a fetish or a uh you know something that i have and you don't people love me but they don't love you and something is a possession which really reduces it to something superficial but when we talk about uh, god's love uh or the love of the divine or the love of 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 spirit we talk about the american indians or the, or the buddhists who don't believe in a self uh that the the everybody agrees that there is this union and communion which is an indivisible whole w h o l e uh which if we if we pay attention to what has no divisions right here in this moment when we're aware of awareness we realize because awareness has no form where are the edges where does it begin and end it uh uh like uh, what is wholeness uh, that quality has no edges it has no it's it, it's immeasurable that which is whole and complete uh also look at thinking as a verb or sensing or feeling or smelling or tasting or hearing these verbs these activities of embodied consciousness they're not confined by what is felt what is heard what is smelled what is thought you know um, what we're aware of how we're objectifying uh, as in terms of the object and a predicate a subject and an object these verbs these activities of consciousness are are not constrained or limited by what they are beholding or what they are managing or transforming or considering uh they are indivisible they are timeless they are ever present always now and we share them in our meeting with one another when we meet a stranger we meet in this undivided unconditioned as yet to be conditioned awakeness that is mirror like that is non reactive that we are open to who we're meeting and they're open to meeting us as in awareness uh so that we can transform by the surprise and delight and joy and love of our the newness of our being that we're sharing so these are essential pivotal perennial qualities that we share with the, our loved ones with our as what we are with ourselves 
and meeting ourselves again a fresh moment and with every new stranger that we meet. So even here online in this moment, when you, you're you meeting uh, this one here and Christmas there, uh, we're all strangers to ourselves and one another. And everything is fresh and new every moment in this indivisible uh, wholeness, which has no real image. It's an activity of consciousness. And the more we know ourselves to be that which causes the change, that which is required for change, uh, we are liberated uh, as sentient human beings. Oh, I love what you just said. Wow. We we are but the mere reflection of our interior landscape. And our exterior is just serving as an indicator to our vibrational output every minute of every day. So we can always pick up clues to what's going on inside by what's going on outside, right? And I believe ultimately everything is serving your relationship with yourself. And that brings us back to God. Good orderly design is something that I feel God might stand for. And I didn't like the G word at first when I first got sober, but I surrendered to the experience of, of serving humanity and that the existence of a power greater than myself. And, you know, that evolved from there in 2012, but I had to kind of undo going on from what we talked about in the first conversation, unlearn a lot of the religious doctrines and dogmas that were infused upon me. There we go. The blue, the imprint again, to get back to that divine organic blueprint, which now I see is, is sacred geometrical designs that are uh, absorbed into my field to create order am amidst the chaos. But we want to be riding the wave of chaos so that we're expanding and creating new. That's utopian timeline, right? Um, but not stay stuck so much that we dip down into depression because we're, we're too afraid to um, take a risk and to put ourselves out there. So all of that was part of my process of surrendering. And I literally had to hand it over, let go and let God and um, stop trying to control things. Uh, and in a sense, that really helped me uh, develop a, an unshakable faith that I feel is required as we find ourselves in this bifurcation at this convergence point. It's, you know, what are you faithful to? Who and what do you trust? And, and, and what is real? Right. So all of these themes are coming up again. And for me, that is ascension. If I start to really look at closing the gap between my high, me and my highest self, closing the gap between my true self and my false self here on the psychological level, on the earth plane, right? That's the mind polarity based union or integration that needs to take place and closing the gap between me and God. Right. And that for me was like resolving the identity crisis, because as you said, so, so beautifully, if you identify with love, which to me is synonymous with God, or that's what God is, it's, it's love, pure, unconditional love. For me, that sort of reconciliated all the differences to the point where it didn't matter anymore. And that gets, to what you're paying attention to, because I've noticed in my nuclear family to, to bring the conversation back to like a real earthly experience that I've recently had. We're just paying attention to different aspects of our lives and, you know, rightly or wrongly, we don't really discuss the, the things that cause division and we're able to connect an unconditional love through pictures of our pets and videos of my, my brother's unborn child and his wife's belly and you know it's a beautiful thing that we're paying attention to and one of my great teachers taught me that attention is a currency that's why we pay with it <laughs> and everything is this energetic exchange and you know what is it that you're offering I always try to stop and, and ask myself like are you adding to the situation or are you taking from it in some way and although with my family 
And with you and in, in this video, with, with the viewers on this platform, it felt important for me to stand in my own authenticity and say, well, I'm polarizing it, it this way in order to acknowledge it, in order to integrate and unify. At the same time, I don't need to amplify it or accentuate it or focus on it so much that I'm feeding division because we've learned to just accept each other and we're coming together in a, in a beautiful new awareness that is shared. It's that shared sensitivity that you're mentioning so much um, that I feel that we're starting to learn how to live in our daily lives. It's a practice, right? I mean, some days I do this better than others. But I've never felt particularly political. I've never felt like I needed to impinge my beliefs on anyone. I never understood why anyone would feel like that. Can't we just all have our own unique ones? Can't we all express sentiently in the way that we wish to, whether it's expressing our gender or our sexuality or the way we dress or the way we speak? To embrace all those differences is key because, thank God, we're not all the same. Wouldn't life be boring if we were? (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I think that brings me back to surrender, and that includes surrendering to all the negative feelings, because there's intrinsic value in every negative charged emotion. They're a lot more potent, actually so much more valuable, because they serve as great teachers, and they serve as guideposts or messengers in order to inform our next decision, right? You said something to me recently, Sperry, about mistakes. That I wanted to ask you about because I can sometimes get caught up in feeling like, oh man, I made such a big mistake and really beat myself up over that. And I get out of acceptance and out of love consciousness when I do that, right? What, what, what was it that you said about mistakes? How everything is a mistake, you know? Um, could you go into that a little bit more? Cause I wanted to cover that oh. in this interview. You know, there's a very funny person, uh, who made these little flashcards uh, called Ashley Brilliant. And uh, he would he would have these one-liners, and one of them was, uh, uh, you know, if you're worried about what you're going to do, uh, whether it's going to be a mistake, of course it's going to be a mistake. <laughs> Everything you do is a mistake. <laughs> and uh, to realize that there is no... Um, perfection, if you will, uh, except very momentarily, like, you know, we get something or achieve something. And then for a while, we feel like, wow, I really accomplished something there. Or we do something that we really feel ashamed of. And for, you know, it feels like we never will survive that because it's so painful. Uh, I mean, it, it feels like we're going to be, we're being boiled in the oil or being burnt at the stake or something. We're, we're so ashamed of what we've done, uh, because we could have done it better or we just feel like we humiliated ourselves, uh, yeah. even if nobody else spelled anything. Uh, <laughs> I've totally had it. that recently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we ourselves feel, you know, horrified with ourselves. And so, um, we're uh, we're an ever evolving form that is being caused to change by our formlessness, which cannot be divided against itself. This awareness, which is the you know required for all change, it's not just required. As we've said, it is uh, change is required because of awareness. So awareness is a constant, and change is is. <laughs> is constant and uh, so we we talked last uh, about how the we're uh, we're a verb instead of just a noun yes we we can put labels on ourselves uh but those labels are going to have to change we might have sticky notes that we put on our mirror uh that is receiving and reflecting us um in order to contemplate them and uh so that we can educate this new brain, this verbal analytic child, which is an epiphenomena or an emergent quality of our heartfelt mammalian limbic nervous system, uh, which was given birth to by 
uh, are reptilian, uh, much more ancient, uh, uh, you know, intelligence, which, uh, which we need to be integrated with our heart and with our, our new brain. And, and, and we need to integrate together as a, as a single consciousness, as, as expressions of God or, or the divine or the void, <laughs> which cannot escape itself because, you know, that which is, has never been, uh, cannot be otherwise, uh, because it, it's uncreated and unborn. Uh, it is eternal. And in that way, uh, is as the, as the observer of all that does change is that which causes all change and makes everything be recombined and, and regenerated and represented to itself. Uh, we are, uh, one big mistake in, in the offing, <laughs> if you will. So, um, we need to enjoy how surprising we are. Uh, we're, we're unknowable. Uh, we're indefinable. Uh, we're immeasurable. In fact, uh, we may call our, call ourselves names like good little girl, good little boy, uh, and call other people bad little girl and bad little boy sometimes and good little girl and good little boy. But, uh, you know, and that has extreme applications and we need to be able to, you know, call a spade a spade, uh, sort of thing. Uh, we need to objectify things. We need to, to look at and experience things in that way. But we don't want to forget that we're, we're moving from being many to the one. We're moving from being nouns to being verbs to being activities. We're moving from being somebody doing something a certain way and being known for that and being acknowledged for that and being paid for that. Uh, you know, as a uh, as a resource, uh, but then even celebrities, of course, they get stuck in roles and they want to break out of those roles. And when and it's only a very very small percentage of celebrities that can break out of a role that they've been tasked, cast, typecast, yeah, uh, typecast uh, yeah. in uh, without losing their they're standing in uh, as an actor or actress. Uh, it's a very, very rare, very exceptional. And so, of course, we all want to be that very, very rare, exceptional celebrity who is on the scene and on the screen, on camera, and everybody's giving their undivided attention to us, like a guru who soaks up the undivided attention of their disciples and uh, you know, it's like the sage on the stage, uh, but is really actually at some level functioning as sort of a, a spiritual vampire. I mean, we've gone through uh, being parented by our own parents, and then we sought spiritual parents through gurus, and we're we're outliving that or overcoming that, and now we're we're looking to be our own gurus, our own to be self-taught. Uh, and and ultimately discovering that the act, the source of of self learning of both with a small s and a capital s is this no self this anatta a n a t t a you can look it up on Wikipedia it's the no self that Gautama Buddha and so many other Hindus and Buddhists talk about the the void that we that Namkai Norbu talks about that we that is the is the state of Rigpa, the state of Dzogchen, uh, that the bone tradition uh, created 18,000 years ago and became Dzogchen in Buddhism. We are that which is discovering this, uh, that which cannot be created or destroyed, that which is, you know, is deathless, it doesn't die. So if you've had a near-death experience, like I've had uh, at the age of four, you realize that you cannot die. And this is an amazing transformation that people, uh, as of maybe 20 years ago, there were 10 million people who have had reported near-death experiences. And, and these are life-changing experiences. I mean, to realize in actuality, in the flesh, in, in this inescapable 
experience uh, that reduces all your objectifications of who you thought you were and what you thought you were doing to that, this, this single knowing, this verb that, that is you know, ever present, even though it gets covered up by the sticky notes on the mirror, you can just take all those sticky notes off your mirror and re be received and reflected as the mirror, as what you appear to be, what you seem to be, the mistake <laughs> that you are in the moment <laughs> with egg on your face or with a smile on your face yeah. and, and, and give yourself a big hug and say, I love you. I love you unconditionally. It doesn't matter how you appear or show up or what you do, how many mistakes you make or how many successes you have. I love you uh, indivisibly and forever. And uh, we are love, love with you. How about you, Christmas? Holy Christmas. <laughs> oh, holy Christmas. Fez, you touched on so much. That was brilliant. Um, I, I am with you all the way in the whole verb thing. We are becoming uh, that which we wish to experience in the flesh. So, you know, what we think we become. And it's we're in that constant act of being the action that we take right? Rather than the person or the, the embodiment of what we think we, we are, because that's rife with attachments, that's rife with expectations, that's rife with assigning meanings to things that might be done with, with crossed wires from the lens of our past, or from the um, perspective of our traumas, if they're not yet resolved. And that's what can lead us astray. That's what can really lead us down a path that we don't want to be away from our true selves and away from our higher purpose. And so it's about closing that gap because I always think of it as the angle, like angel angle. If you're even like 1% off, think how far away you, you get from yourself. Even though it starts out really small, it's like you end up way far away from who you really are if you don't resolve those emotional issues. And I always bring it back to the emotions because I think they're the centerpiece for the entire equation. That's what underpins the best and worst of human human behavior, right? And and that's the natural part of the expansion of consciousness is these emotional breakthroughs that we're able to achieve. So I, I invite everybody to see negative things or situations, mistakes, you know, as things that are happening for you, not to you. They are serving your highest good always. And that gets back to God, the good orderly design of whatever is meant to be is meant to be in this divine moment. So everything's one big splat out now, right? Mm. And that helps me because that can motivate me to find my way towards integration of an experience that I might otherwise feel inclined to reject <laughs> because I feel that shame or that imperfection. And, and that leads me down a path of abandonment because that's one of my wounds, if you will. And I guess I want to talk about that for just a minute, because I feel that to find my way to purpose, I've really had to understand my deepest traumas. And that my purpose is the direct opposite of those. <laughs> so the shaming that I experienced from addiction, the extremes I was willing to go to, to avoid my feeling body, um, and, and abandonment and not fitting in, all lead me to my purpose, which is being activated here and now, right? And I was only able to activate those dormant strands of DNA by tending to my emotional body, right? And that's how I hold higher light quotients. That's how I hold greater photonic density. That's how I clear the channels between me and my guides, my guidance system, you know, my mother plan of Alcyone, where there's a living library in Akasha, the star soul collective experience, you know? And that makes it exciting to live. And who would want to drink alcohol and numb themselves out when you're supposed to be here doing that, awake and aware and alive? So it's given me the will to live. Because when I had my near-death experience in 2012, I wanted to die. The density of this planet was too much for me. Everything felt overwhelming. And I didn't know how 
to manage my emotions. I didn't know how to cope. Self-regulation was not a word in my dictionary. (laughs) And so obviously part of my journey was learning about emotions, retraining as a psychotherapist, then sort of evolving to become more of an energy worker and any energy healer. And it's that verbiage that you, you, you've so beautifully said, I keep becoming greater aspects of self as I actualize to my fullest potential in the now moment. And of course, that glass ceiling is always going like this as we collectively ascend. And, you know, we're all doing this together and we're all catalyzing each other. I just want to say, I feel like we're all in this together. And the more that someone else does it on the other side of the planet, you're doing it there in Honolulu, you literally activate and awaken that aspect in me. I pluck my that string inside me and it goes, oh yeah. And it gives me more magic to manifest. And again, it's about animating that, animating that 5D structure and each playing our own unique roles as we walk each other home along this journey. But um, to go back to something else you said, I did want to note there were a couple things actually. The programs that can stifle that process. And one of them I've identified lately is the program of neutrality and keeping the peace. Um, do you believe there are, those are programs, Barry? Do you believe those are ways in which we're manipulated emotionally from that arconic matrix grid structure in order to stop us and, and sort of censor us or suppress our speaking out? And I say that because there is so such extreme censorship occurring right now. Social media platforms are literally just cutting free thinkers off left, right, and center. And that was one of the reasons why I felt really compelled to do this video today, this uh, series of interviews with you. So, yeah, what, what do you think the arconic structures are, the main ways of uh, manipulating? Do you think it's all done emotionally to stifle our sentience? Well, uh, my sense is that it's being done on every possible level. Uh, it's, you know, it's a one up, one down, uh, where, where we, we love love and, uh, uh, the arconic dynamic is one of, uh, of, you know, I'm above you and I have my, the jack boot, boot, boot of, uh, of my dictation, you know, on your face forever, <laughs> kind of like the, um, uh, the, the picture of fascism is one of, um, complete and utter, uh, suffocation of, of spiritual religious and personal freedom so uh if i'm an archon uh i feel safer and more powerful and power is a drug it's you know if we feel extremely powerful or have power and especially have power over the earth or power over everybody who works for us or power over our children i mean often parents will get a great deal of um you know, hits on their dopamine and serotonin by uh, dominating their children, for example. And and then the, the children learn to do that. So the oldest child perhaps uh, you know, treats their younger brother or sister uh, as less than and humiliates them and puts them down and trips them up or does tricks on them or... Uh, you know, outsmarts them, and so to as to make the them, you know, that arconic reptilian uh, quality within each of us, which we all have. I mean, we were yeah. some say we were actually, uh, you know, that DNA was perpetuated artificially and deliberately in us uh, as part of these sixty-four experiments that have been done on us for the last. 300,000 years by a group of, uh, of, of extraterrestrials that have agreed on these 22 experiments. Uh, and so 
the archons uh, among them um, who had you know a, a, a significant portion of their uh, evolution on this planet uh, who in many respects feel that they own this planet they really uh you know hate us and want to wipe us out basically because we're um we're keeping them from transforming the atmosphere of the planet to be more methane rich so they can live on the surface uh as was more the case back in uh in these very very warm periods uh where there is much more uh carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and methane and so they are relegated to living in atmospherically controlled chambers underneath the surface at this very moment. Um, and uh, they want, they've been petitioning for the ownership of the earth for quite some time. Uh, the actual statistics and, and reality is that they don't really have that right. And uh, the the Galactic Federation, which the Israeli scientists just came out and admitted to, was one of the top astrophysicists and and uh, you know space scientists uh, in the world uh, for thirty years, in charge of the one of the top programs, uh, was given permission to come forward as part of the disclosure movement because humanity needs to learn about the fact that uh, you know. There are ETs, and uh, and they've been here, uh, living in the Earth and around us, uh, all around us. Many of them looking almost indistinguishable from from how we look, uh, and many others who don't look anything like us, uh, but are also quadrupedal and uh, you know quite you know, smaller or larger than us. We're um, we're in the midst of. Uh, as Emery Smith said, if you want to have some sense of how many species uh, there are uh, in the universe, just think about how many species there are in our oceans. Uh, you know, we're talking about millions of species. Uh, even in just the Milky Way alone, there, even by the most conservative estimates, uh, there are, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Earth-like planets that, that could support life. And um, uh, and we have military people that have, like Corey Good, who've been trained from a young, young boy to be taken uh, and trained as an empath uh, and with military training with other empaths to go into these conferences with with 64 different extraterrestrial races and uh, and try to determine whether people, whether they're lying. I mean, they're often speaking telesomatically uh, and communicating in languages that, that Earth, you know, that we don't understand here on Earth. And so only uh, somebody who's deeply trained in nonverbal empathy can understand whether some, somebody is being ingenuine uh, so how do we navigate this extra political or exo political uh, universe that we're, we're in? And, and now we're being told by a super soldier who has been brought up from the ground up as from a child uh, and given every kind of inoculation and uh, implantation of uh, you know, artificial intelligence that that we could come up with, uh, and other extraterrestrial races have, have gifted us to be the super soldier and a, mar a Marine that is now being tasked with, uh, on Gaia television to, uh, with Emery Smith interviewing him to, for us to find out about, you know, the ET presence and, uh, his meetings with thousands of different extraterrestrials and being at war with different types of extraterrestrials and what are they like and knowing all about them and, and having to know about them that like a military Marine that he is would need to know about them and has to be trained to deal with these people in the battlefield effectively with weapons. And, and so these, uh, 
these video interviews that Gaia is releasing to the general public, you don't have to have a subscription nowadays uh, that I sent you uh, yesterday that you viewed. Yeah, they were uh, awesome. Thank you. We're in a whole other realm here where we're, uh, it's now known that it looks like we're going to be attacked. Uh, we're going to have an alien invasion here on this planet coming up even fairly soon by uh, by an insect uh, ET pop population that it typically uh, they they attack and they use up the precious natural resources of an asteroid belt or a planet or a civilization and they uh, uh, they they use them up in large quantities because there's just such an overwhelming number of them like we look at a a giant ant colony in northern Australia that build these huge mounds, and there are just millions of these ants that have a telesomatic form of communication where they each know what needs to be done uh, and how they serve in a unique individual way, uh, each in their own way. And so they are highly organized. And one of the things that we that the spiritual movement, the spiritual awakening on our planet here it has as a disadvantage is that we have been dominated by uh, a ruling class, by a power elite, by a, a type of, uh, you know, monarchy, uh, a, a, fa a monarchical, fascistic, communistic uh, type of you know, top-down, pharaohic rulership. And because we were so gelatinous and unfocused and unable to know who and what we were, we we know, we needed rulers to show us and tell us and give us guidance. And even though they were maybe, um, you know, like Genghis Khan, their power was based on how they could you know, have power over others and kill those who didn't, were faithful or trustworthy to their power structure, which was very cruel and very evil in our eyes and our hearts looking at it today. So in closing, uh, as in the landmark education program, which probably many of you know about or have been through, uh, they help us understand our predicament by seeing ourselves as meaning-making machines, that we have rackets and we have winning formulas, that we, uh, you know, we want to be known for our winning formula and we want to suppress and deny our racket, you know, how we are uh, really fooling ourselves and fooling other everybody else. Uh, and so, and get so caught up in this meaning making machine that we lose ourselves in the forest among the trees. And we don't realize that what we really are as this void based awakeness that is featureless and mirror like and choiceless and ever present, it has no meaning. It doesn't need to have a meaning in order to receive and reflect all possible meanings. So, ironically, this where formlessness unites and makes all forms reunite and re regenerated and represented to themselves, to this formless witness, this eternal, you know, immortal being that we each and all are. This being, because it's not identified with or trapped or limited by any one meaning, it can be meaningless and yet be the source by receiving and reflecting all possible meanings, it is actually the source and origin of all that is meaningful. <laughs> so ironically, equals and opposites come together and they create this uh, magnificence that we call nature and life itself and the evolution of our awakening to uh, awaken as this thrilling, joyful, effortless, heaven-sent, you know, ecstasy and nirvana that we are meant to, uh, to embody as relative 
bodies, hearts, and minds as flesh and blood uh, in this universe. Somebody had to go through it. Somebody had to um, suffer through all this in order to mature what it is to have a form so that where we go in between lives, which is heaven, heavenly and nirvana-like, uh, we can bring that heaven to earth. And so as the universe continues to expand in space over time, as energy and matter, as minds and bodies into the ever more dense forms that are more deeply interconnected and interconnecting, that we can uh, bring this indivisibility of, of, of this communion of meaningless, this meaning-making machine as unidentified with the meanings that it makes so that we can enjoy them and have fun with them, like kittens playing in the garden, learning how to hunt. Uh, so farewell for this for, for now. And uh, I'll hand it over to say goodnight to you, Christmas. <laughs> Thanks, Fez. Ah, uh, the paradoxical nature of the spiritual path. It is that releasing of resistance that forges and paves the way that is the antidote through the madness. And that's how we reach that integration point that is so pivotal in our own healing journey. And that's what this is all about. So... We'll bring the conversation to a close. Stay tuned for the next episode where we pick right up where we left off. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and comment. We love to hear from you. Bye for now.